Coming up, Apple and LG go watch to watch. Is the LG G4 the best phone ever? A headset that will save your kids hearing and a way to carry your drone. You've got to watch before you buy. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Before You Buy is brought to you by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This episode of Before You Buy is brought to you by iFixit. You can fix it, and iFixit makes it easy with free step by step repair guides, high quality replacement parts, and all the tools you'll ever need. For $10 off your purchase of $50 or more, go to iFixit.com slash twit and enter the code Before You Buy at checkout. Welcome to Before You Buy, it's Twitch Review Show, where we get the gadgets and gizmos from around the brick house, and we give them to our hosts and staff <laughs> members to get some honest you reviews. You give them to me. Give them, we give them to Leo. He starts off with him. Now, Leo, two weeks ago, you showed us a first look at the Apple Watch. It was yep. an unboxing. Yep. You've had two weeks to play with it. Now you're going to give us your honest review. Yeah, and then I lost interest because I got the new Android <laughs> Wear Watch from LG. <laughs> no, I didn't. Um, you know, I'm going to do both. And there's a reason. So, yeah, I've had the Apple Watch for two weeks. In fact, the first one I had was the 38 millimeter that Lisa uh, got first. But Apple stepped up their production, I guess, or they're getting them out faster than they expected. So a lot of people have started to get their Apple Watches a little quicker. So I got my 42 millimeter about a week I, ago. I got to say, that looks better on you than the 38. Yeah, the 38 was a little small. You know, you, you'll want to get one that fits your wrist. Uh, the band also expands. In fact, the 38 was too small for some of my larger... Mm -hmm friends to get even to get on their wrists so you certainly and i can see now why apple is making a point of having people go to the uh, apple store and try them on you still have to order online but you might want to try on different bands and so forth this is the milanese loop as uh, i'm showing it the stainless steel with milanese loop is 700 bucks half as much the lg urbane i uh think this is a very interesting android wear watch because it's the first android wear watch running 5.1 mm -hmm. and so it's very lollipop and some very nice features uh built in because of the lollipop uh interface you know it's it's uh it's kind of it's kind of prettier than it used to be so you see th the applications show up here uh, there's a lot in common between these two watches including in believe it or not the price because at its base the apple watch with the rubber band is 350 bucks a sport version this is 350 dollars this comes with a leather band it's a standard 22 millimeter band so you can use any watch band on this both have oled screens and now that's a big improvement for android wear and it's apple's very first oled screen which is kind of interesting apple's not known uh for using oled screens on the iphone or any of its devices so to see uh, an oled screen on this is really great and it's one of the reasons i think apple has reduced the number of uh optional faces you can't get third-party faces on a apple's watch it like you can on android where and i think that's because apple wants to maximize battery life by maximizing black pixels black as you know on oled doesn't use any juice there are though plenty of beautiful screens on the apple watch and uh and uh, I th they're all customizable. So I think that if, if it's pure aesthetics you're going for, the Apple Watch is a more refined experience. Um, even, even when you put these two together, I got the gold version of the Urbane. It's, it's a little, I don't know. It's, it's yeah, well, yeah. It looks like I got it in. Uh, <laughs> although you are under a subway stand, in New you're York dealing City. with the square look versus the circular look, and for some people that that does make a big I, difference. I like round. This has no flat tire, by the way. As uh, remember, that was an right, issue some right. people had with the, uh, and and this is just one of the faces that comes with the uh, LG Urbane. There are actually quite a few faces, more than two thousand available for uh, Android Wear in general. Android Wear is interesting because Google is very specific about what you can do with software. So for the most part, the internals of the Android Wear watches, the software anyway, uh, is the same. But uh, the manufacturers can do a lot with the, the body, the case. They have a lot of leeway there. And in this case, LG has also added an app that lets me make a phone call. Now, that's one of the few really big differences between these. I can make and take phone calls on the Apple Watch directly from the watch. It has a microphone and speaker. The Apple phone has to be nearby to do that because the phone call is actually going through your iPhone. Right. In fact, just earlier today, I got a phone call. The phone was out here. 
I was in the back. I could see the call coming in. I could pick it up, but the call could not complete because I was too far from the phone. So that's an important point to make. Both uh, Apple uh, and LG's uh, Urbane use Wi-Fi now. That's one of the new things about a Lollipop 5.1 on the uh, Android Wear watch. That means I can be anywhere with either of these watches, as, as and the phone can be anywhere. As long as we're on the same Wi-Fi network, all the functionality continues. So the Apple Watch uses Bluetooth LE unless it needs a higher data rate or it's more distant from the phone, then it switches to Wi-Fi. Pretty much the same thing for the, the new Android Wear watches, including this one. Let me ask you about that. What was your, your sense of, of answering calls from your phone? Were, were you okay with it? Did you like it? Was it a novelty, or was it something you would do on a regular it, basis? It's kind of a novelty. It's handy if your phone is not handy mm. or you don't want to get it out. And you just want to quickly say, hey, I can't talk right now. I'll call you back. It's really good for that. In fact, that's the, ex the use case that Apple gives in the videos on the Apple website. You kind of talking into your wrist, you kind of look a little dorky. I'm not sure you'd want to do that right. for very long. The, uh, having said that, the speaker is le you know, very audible, uh, what, legible. I want to say, what's the... Audible. Oh, audible? Mm -hmm. All right. Not like the book company. It's just, <laughs> yeah, it's just audible. Uh, and the speaker and the microphone works well. So people can hear you and you can hear them. So you could, uh, frankly, have a conversation. There's another big difference that I think is important, people should be aware of, between Apple Watch and Android Wear. Android Wear always has a low power face. Now, you can turn it off. They call it the ambient display. So you always have a watch that works on Android Wear. You can't say the same for Apple Watch. You get a completely, in order to save battery life, completely black face until you wake the watch up by raising it uh, to see what time it is. They both are gorgeous. I mean, I really think that um, uh, an OLED display is a great choice. And there are a lot of really nice, interesting uh, watch faces. You can could, you could see I have quite a few of them already here on the uh, Android Wear. And because it's OLED, it's really crisp. You, it might trick you into thinking that's a physical watch face. I, I really like the look of this, um, but I would say that the Apple Watch feels more refined. The software it feels like somebody's put more thought into it, has spent more time in it. Having said that, the uh, the constant heart rate meter uh, on the watch is good, but the exercise monitoring seems to be kind of hit or miss. Sometimes it knows. I spent half an hour on a, on a treadmill yesterday. I thought I went, uh, you know, a quarter of a mile. Um, you can add these glances, and it's it's funny because really, both watches are solving similar problems. Uh, in, in similar ways, the swiping is the most common way to interface with either watch. With the Apple Watch, when you swipe down, you'll see notifications. Um, when you swipe up, you'll see what they call glances. You can choose which applications show up here. I have a, you'll probably want to choose a small number. Um, the heart rate meter is pretty amazing on the Apple Watch. It measures constantly every 10 minutes, so you have a record of your heart rate over time. And it does a fairly accurate job. It, it's using some sophisticated technology. The heart rate meter on here, well, actually, it'd be fun, kind of fun to, to, uh, <laughs> Let's compare, to them. compare them, wouldn't it? All right. Boy, I'm, I should be dead right now. 122 beats per minute. Uh, the problem is, part of it is that the watches not are quite on different on the right, positions. Yeah. yeah, You really want the watch for the best heart rate not to be on a bone Oh, wow. <laughs> well, no, but no, no, no. But that was the previous measurement, and that is 77 on the Apple Watch, 79 on this watch. I think they're, you know, as soon as the cameras go on, my heart rate goes through the roof. So I think that actually they're fairly, they were fairly close. Uh, 77 here, 79 there, before we went on the air. As soon as we went on the air, it went up about 50 What minutes. about responsiveness? I, I've yeah, noticed you're you taking go. a couple See, that's of... that's on a bone. That's Whoa. not going to do a very good job. Well, your bone's doing well. <laughs> uh, is it responsive but equally on both? Because I've seen you do a couple of extra swipes on the LG. Uh, yeah, that's not that it's not responsive. Well, maybe it is. Um, it's probably more likely I'm just doing the wrong thing. I'll tell you what's interesting is responsiveness. Most of the time when you're going to do stuff with the watch, you're going to talk to it. So you're going to raise the watch and go, hey, Siri. Hey, oh, Siri. No. Hey, Siri. I would like to send a text to Robert Balasser. Yeah, screw you, Siri. <laughs> on, on, the, on the Google Watch, it's, okay, Google. And oh. So responsiveness seems to vary. Uh, Lisa's Apple Watch has seemed to stop listening to her. <laughs> um, and and I, I've had to, on this Apple Watch, reboot it a couple of times, turn it off and on, or in fact do a hard reset because it stopped measuring heart rate for a few days, things like that. I think both, in, in, this is a more mature product, the Android oh, yeah, Wear product. That's first so gen. this is a first Apple, I shouldn't say this because if you're listening, you don't know what I'm pointing to. The Apple Watch is a first gen product. Having said that, 
the Apple Watch in design is probably more refined. Look, you've got Mark Newsom and Johnny Ive, the best designers in the world, working on the Apple Watch. Uh, but that's a matter of taste. You might say, hey, you know what? I like a round face better. I'm going to prefer that. Software is, you can, you can feel that they've put a lot of, Apple's put a lot of thought into the software. And for the most part, it's pretty innovative. But on the other hand, there's some less than great stuff. You've probably already seen the crazy icon layout on here. Um, <laughs> that would just confuse me. It's, it's not useful. You can zoom in, but it's, it's just not useful. Um, so most of the time, you're going to say, hey, Siri, and launch the application from that point. I just did a rower workout, 22 minutes, 209 calories, 52 resting. It showed my average heart rate. Uh, you can save that workout, which is nice. You also get, well, I don't know. I don't know if there's anything to write home about, but you get little awards, achievement. I got an achievement for something. I set a new personal record yesterday. You want to see my award? Get ready. It's pretty stunning. It's, a, it's Captain America uh, wields his mighty shield. Oh, wait, I don't know what that's it is. That's supposed to be a shield? I don't like know what it is. Button or it's a thing. A I got a button. Thank you. <laughs> Last time I got a 3D wait, star. Have you sent your heartbeat to Lisa? Yeah. Yet? Yeah, that's another thing you can't do on Android where I don't know if that's really, that's a, <laughs> not exactly a, a deal app. breaker. So here are my, uh, the, my people. This is the favorites. It automatically populates those from your iPhone. If you're lucky enough to have a favorite who has a watch, you'll see there's a call icon, a text icon, and this touch icon. And you just rest your finger on here. And now I'm sending Lisa a heartbeat. It only goes through about half the time. And I don't think it really, uh, at first, cool, at later on, less cool. But you it's haptic. It's not vibration. It's well, taptic. that's another. You've heard me talk about yeah. that, obviously. Vibration's vibration. I don't really get the difference between the except for marketing, between the taptic vibration and the vibration on any other device. The Android Wear vibrates as well. Um, I, don't, I don't think that's a selling point. Um, it does have a very nice speaker, and the uh, notification chimes and rings are quite lovely. Um, as far as I know, this doesn't make any sound at all. So uh, the <laughs> Apple Watch wins in that regard. So you get, you, you, you get a choice of price points. I mean, $350 to $17,000 in the Apple Watch. But when you compare a $350 Apple Watch to a $350 Android Wear Watch, they're much of a muchness. I think what you're going to want to do is look at some of the different features, like the ability to take a place a phone call or send a heartbeat on the Apple Watch, the ability to work with Google Now on the Android Wear Watch. You're also going to want to consider what kind of phone you use. Mm -hmm. If you're an Android user, you're going to have to use Android Wear, at least for the time being. iPhone users, we're going to have to use the Apple Watch. The Pebble Watch crosses both platforms, but it does not offer that kind of functionality. If you want an always-on watch, the ambient display on Android Wear is going to, I think, wow you. Um, I love the, if you, you know, and if you use Google services, integration with Google, of course, is much better. I think my bottom line on this, I'll give you the, the pros and cons on each are the same. They are exercise monitors, which do a great job of motivating you simply by telling you how you've done. The act of importing it and keeping track of it makes you feel good. It makes you probably more likely to exercise. They also do a good job of showing you notifications from your phone. In fact, Apple gives you an application on the iPhone that lets you control exactly which notifications come onto the watch. So you can really customize it to give you what you need. I have my calendar on here and all of that. And that's, that's very useful. I think that, it, but the notifications on the Android Wear watch are similar they're Google Now cards so mm -hmm. that's that's kind of the difference and the new Android Wear I wish I had some notifications on here the new I, I'll get some set up the new Android Wear allows you to go like this and and flick through the cards which is okay kind of neat uh, I, my opinion so notifications health and a wristwatch my opinion is that neither kinds of smart in fact no kind of smart watch is is a necessity in the sense that you're going to turn around if you leave home without it and say oh shoot i forgot my watch go back and get it i think in most cases it's an adjunct to the phone you already have it does require a phone being present for the watch to do anything and i i think that that's important to keep in mind uh in both cases the phone could be somewhere else in the in the house or the office but it still has to be there i think it's really a matter of which phone which phone do you use android or iphone uh, whether you like the idea of a smart watch, there, the Apple Watch is not in any respect head and shoulders above All the right. competition. That's the most important thing. It's not a buy. It's not a don't buy. It's a try because it really depends very much on what you're looking for. Uh, if, it, if it's jewelry you want, Apple certainly can sell you something in the $17,000 range. If it's functionality you're looking for and you use Google Apps and you use... Uh, Android, uh, I think the uh, Android Wear is great. And of all the Android Wears I've tried, 
and if, which and I've tried them all. This LG Urbane is uh, easily the nicest. It's got five one, but expect more five one uh, lollipop five one watches to come. Uh, I, which one am I going to wear? Gosh. Depends on which phone you're depends using. Depends which phone I'm carrying. So these are not platform switchers. They're not going to make you go with an iPhone if you've got an Android so. or Android I think you've got they're an iPhone. so close. Unless you say, I absolutely have to be able to answer calls on my watch, or I absolutely want that little button that gives you the shield for your reward. <laughs> there, there's, there's not, I don't think there's anything that's going to make you say, oh, I got, I'm going to uh, forget the Android. I'm going to go buy an iPhone because I want an, an, an Apple Watch. They're, they're very, in fact, much more similar than they are dissimilar. Um, and I would say choose your phone first. There are massive differences between iPhone and Android phones. And then you're going to get the watch uh, that makes sense for that platform. And frankly, uh, don't feel like, oh, gosh, I'm going to have to suffer because I have to get an Android Wear watch. There's a lot of parity between these two. What I love is you're going to see a seesaw battle back and forth. Different bands, uh, different functionality, different hardware. Remember Google's big... Uh, uh, Google I.O. Developers Conference is coming up at the end of the month. They may announce something new with Android Wear there. I wouldn't be surprised at all to see a next-generation Wear. Apple is obviously all in on the Apple Watch. That's going to continue to evolve. It's very much a first-generation product, but a lot of thought and a lot of refinement in there. I think it's a uh, try in both cases. There you have it. Be it an iPhone or an Android, you've got options if you want to wear your tech. That's a try from Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Oh, now, battery life, oh, identical. Identical. Both get through a day, that's all. Oh, uh, Leo, unfortunately, you're not found very often on the Twit TV network. I know. Mm. Um, you know, Google me, and maybe <laughs> you'll find... <laughs> you know, tomorrow, we're very excited. Yes. Uh, it's the new Screensavers, episode two. Kevin Rose is going to stop by. Morgan Webb's going to stop by. And we're going to take an Apple Watch, maybe mine, and gold plate it. <laughs> and and you will not be able to tell the difference between this and a seventeen thousand dollar Apple Watch. Wait, are you going to increase the value of your watch by about seventeen thousand yeah, dollars? Yeah, it's exciting. Yeah, yeah. We'll talk watches. Actually, what, it, because Kevin's such a watch fanatic, yeah. he's going to bring some classic. You know, we may have to hire some extra watches. security to keep people away. These from are going to be gorgeous watches. Yeah. So Kevin will show us some watches. We'll talk about. That whole new thing of smartwatches. That's tomorrow on uh, about 3 p.m. Pacific, 6 p.m. Eastern Time. The new screensavers, 2200 UTC. Don't miss it. Live.twit.tv. Or if you're in the area, you should be calling for tickets because it's a great watch in studio. Again, Leo Laporte, folks. A great watch. Get it? You'll be watching the watches. Okay, just fade me we're going to we're going to punt him out. So, when we come back, we're going to be giving you a, a little bit more tech, but before we do that, we've decided to give Megan Maroney some mommy tech. That's right, some headphones that might be just the thing your kids need to protect their hearing. I am Megan Maroney for Before You Buy. I also host i5 for the iPhone and Tech News Tonight on the Twit Network and iPad Today. I am reviewing the Kids Gear headset with the audio <coughs> limiter, which is prevents tiny eardrums or 10-year-old eardrums here from busting out by turning the volume too loud. These, this headset connects to iPads, iPhones, Samsung phones, Android phones, pretty much anything. It's your basic connector. Uh, and you can also, the headset part of it makes, you know, you can talk to friends or if you're FaceTiming or playing a game where you want to talk to someone, you can do all that with this headset. One thing to note about this is this is the audio limiter and it can be taken off. So if you have a very smart child like this one, uh, <laughs> you can maybe tell them that they really don't want to take this off. They really want to limit the audio so that... Uh, they don't blow out their eardrums. They can blow out their eardrums later when they go to, you know, a Katy Perry concert or something like that. But but not at home while using these. Uh, they come in five different colors. They uh, purple, pink, orange. They're really soft. They have uh, padding. Um, you can just nod yes or no. Are they soft on your ears? Yes. Yeah. Not not hard on your ears. The audio limit is approximately 80 percent. That's what they promise. So that is uh, lower 20 decibels lower of the original. <coughs> sound. The pros are that they're very soft on their ears. There's good padding. It's comfortable for you. Yeah. Uh, the other pro is that it lowers the, um, the volume level by 20 decibels, which is good. Uh, the other <coughs> pros are they come in different colors. Uh, the headset works well so you can talk. Um, and the cons, I would say the only con really is that this you can separate the audio limiter so that uh, if you have an ingenious child that really wants to listen to very loud 
Minecraft videos on YouTube, then they can unplug it and plug it in and risk really damaging their hearing, which is definitely a con. I would say that it is a buy, really. The, it also has this adjuster, so they can adjust here volume up or down. Um, the only drawback is that, that the audio limit is, limiter is separate. If you have a small child who just pulls it out and plugs it in, then you could risk them hurting their eardrums. So maybe keep an eye on them while they're using it. That's all. I would say it's a buy. Thanks. That's a buy for the Kids Gear headset from Megan Maroney. Now, there have been questions about uh, the child that we use in the video. That, I mean, he might be a 3D rendering, but Brian, if you switch to the wide, you can see he's actually, he's a professional model. We borrowed him from our very own Carson Bondi. This is Zachary Bondi. Zachary, say hello. What's up? <laughs> he says, what's up? We're going to be using for all of our mommy tech, all of our kids gear, all of our kid reviews. So you're going to see a lot more of Zach. Now, last month, I got a chance to take a look at some tech at NAB, the National Association of Broadcasters in Las Vegas, Nevada. One of the things that I really enjoyed is the next generation of aerial photography. I stopped by the booth of Unique and, um, well, this is what I found. The story at NAB has definitely been drones, multi-rotors, multi-copters, quadcopters. And we're here at Unique. It's probably the biggest drone company that you've never heard of. Yet yeah, Unique, spelled with a Y, is actually the second largest manufacturer of multi-rotor craft in the world behind DJI. And they've got some pretty sweet gear. I'm here with Sean Phillips, who's going to tell us a little bit about the typhoon and the tornado. Let's start with what we're trying to do overall. We're trying to create the simplest to fly, easy out-of-box products. Highly modular. I have in my hand a ground system. So effectively, we're making aerial and ground imaging solutions. You can have an aircraft like this one flying in the back. It has this exact same camera on it. Uh, I can take great quality video. I bring it down to the ground. I use the same exact camera and gimbal system. I pop it onto my Steadicam, and I can use this as a running, shooting, very steady photography platform. Whether we're using a 2K or a 4K camera on board, it's the exact same system. Uh, the other thing I think it's worth talking about is if you look, all of our controllers always have a screen built in. So what we're trying to do with the ground control unit is make it super simple. You don't need anything except for what you get out of the box to fly the puppy. And when you're flying, you can see that control screen has some things built in uh, that make it easy for the user. There's a camera button. There's a video button. So you can start and stop video, start and stop pictures while flight. You don't have to, as in the traditional, uh, like six months ago, a long time ago in drone life, you would actually have had to start videoing when you start flying. So a lot of features now with the consumer in mind, with the idea that we want to make these things easy to fly. Uh, our unit right now that is the Q500 Plus, the one you see flying, has been out in the market a few months and getting great feedback, so it's available today. Uh, we'll be launching the 4K version within about a month, so that's also going to be a higher-end camera. Uh, you asked about pricing, so the introductory units at around $1,300 today. That's gets you everything you need to fly. One of the things we do in all of our units is we just put two batteries in because you're going to run out of your first battery and you're going to go, darn, I can't fly until I go back and charge for five hours. No, we just start with the idea that we want to give you a per complete product that's ready to use. And, and that's just being honest. Rather than dinging them for a $150 battery pack later, you put it in the box. Uh, that's for a smaller four-rotor craft, right. but you've also got these huge monsters over yeah. here which are for more professional photography. Yep. Tell me a little bit about them. Uh, the Tornado is a hexcopter, uh, but we've done a lot of the same modularity on board. So whether you have it with your hex mode here flying, you can take that same camera gimbal system, take it off, and you can see right there, we got the two-handed steady grip. It's the exact same system. You don't have to buy a new camera or a new gimbal. The controller has the same thing. Oh, this is like infinite looping if we go back and forth. Uh, this controller allows you uh, to control the craft both from a flying perspective or if you want to, to take, as I said, one click for photography, one click for video. Uh, it has a lot of neat stuff built in in that you have a bigger antenna on this because you want to have downlink video direct with that. Uh, you are able to control both uh, the 
let's just control the camera. I'm making it go up and down from here. Or if you want to, a lot of people for serious video are now getting two of these. You'll have one person flying the craft and a second person who's doing the actual control of the video. That way you can get the perfect shot you want. What you're seeing over here at the end is a, another unit still with the same tornado flying system. But with that, you have that very cool big ball gimbal. That's actually an 18x zoom, the industry's first flying 18x zoom digital camera. So you can do very good shots of things that are far away and zoom in close. I'm almost afraid to ask, but yep. pricing and availability on these, I mean, obviously they're much more professional, right. they're much bigger. Right. What are they looking at? Yeah, so, you know, we're still making these, I think, in, in, from a video, from where you were, uh, let's say, even a year ago, uh, at 20, 25,000. These are pretty uh, uh, e easy to use price points at about 5K for the unit without the camera. Uh, actually, and Brian was just demonstrating, one of the things we've done now is made it, uh, even the, the struts are foldable. It's pretty small to pack in. I can just come over here and show you real quick. Uh, you just unscrew this, fold it down, and you're away you go. All right, so your, your form factor, but it's still very solidly built. You can see this is a carbon fiber frame. Uh, very solidly built, lightweight, under five kilos. Not so important in the U.S., but in uh, Europe, there's a five kilo limit on certain uh, application crafts. So we built it to just be under five kilos. Sean, thank you so very much for showing us what Unique has to offer. Could you please tell our audience where they can find more information online about your product? Yeah, the best place to go is unique.com, and you can actually see it probably in the video behind me, the big Unique, but that's unique.com. We're also on many uh, Facebook and YouTube at Unique APV, so there's a lot of information out there, and we welcome anybody who's taking video with our products to send it back to us. One of the cool things is we're creating a community of videographers and really excited to grow this cool industry with all of our friends. Thanks so much. High quality, fun to fly. That's unique. Of course, we're going to be bringing you some more drone action here on Before You Buy. I know some of you are getting a little drone weary, but the next generation is promising some absolutely incredible features. Uh, when we come back, we're going to be taking a look at the LG G4. It uh, may be the best phone we've ever seen here. Of course, we tend to say that a lot. But before we do that, let's go ahead and take a moment to thank the sponsor for this episode of Before You Buy, and it's iFixit. Now, what is iFixit? iFixit isn't just a set of tools. It isn't just something that you use to fix your devices. Everything from your hobbyist toys to your, to your kits, to your computers, to, to pretty much everything you might have around the house iFixit is also a one-stop shop for every kind of repair manual and part that you might need to fix the things in your life. Now, iFixit is the free online repair manual for everything. They have more than 10,000 repair guides for everything from electronics like your smartphone, your tablet, your game console, to your home appliances, your clothing, and yeah, even your bike. They also have foolproof instructions, which I love because they help me fix my stuff quickly. If you've ever shattered your iPhone screen, or if you need to repair the red ring of death on your Xbox, or swap the battery on your Galaxy S5, iFixit has got you covered with parts, tools, and repair guides. iFixit also makes the most trusted repair tools for consumer electronics, including this, the ProTech Toolkit. This is 70 plus tools to assist you with any mod, malfunction, or misfortune that comes your way. The toolkit is the gold standard for electronics work from garage hackers to the CIA and FBI, but more importantly, their unique tools are used by repair technicians everywhere. Now, in this kit, you'll get everything from this static wrist wrap that Alex is destroying to this unique driver kit that includes every kind of bit you may ever need from Torx, Torx Security, Triangular, pretty much if you want to use the right tool, you want to use iFixit. They also include things like spudgers so that you can properly open devices and you can even get that magnetic project mat so you can spell out where screws go so you can reassemble everything once you're done. Best of all, there are thousands of free iFixit guides to help you put your lifetime warranty tools to use. It's only $64.95 and we want you to try it now. With iFixit, you can fix it yourself and iFixit can help. Visit iFixit.com twit for more than 10,000 free step-by-step -step guides iFixit also sells every part and tool that you'll need. Enter the code before you buy at checkout, and you'll save $10 off of any purchase of $50 or more. That's iFixit.com slash twit. iFixit.com slash twit. And use the code before you buy 
to save $10 at checkout. And we thank iFixit for their support of Before You Buy. Now let's go ahead and take a walk over to uh, our very own Miriam Jawar, who's telling us whether or not the LG G4 is the best phone she's ever used. Hey, it's Miriam, and this is Before You Buy with the LG G4. Uh, this is the new flagship from LG, and it is a tremendous phone. I can spoil it a little bit for you right now by telling you this is potentially the best phone on the market today of all phones, and definitely one of the best Android phones on the market. So, LG just launched this about uh, a week and a half ago, and I've got two of them here. The reason for that is I've got the two different covers, as you can see. The one on my left here is a plastic back cover with what they call hammered metal, but it's not real metal though. And the one on my right here is actually a real a leather cover with some really cool stitching, and it feels wonderful. And so yes, this phone has an interchangeable back, and it has micro SD storage, which is kind of why it's so awesome. As you know, the Galaxy S6 is pretty much the best thing in terms of Android phones today, and the LG G4 kind of beats it in, in several ways. So let's give you a quick tour of the G4. As you can see here, there's this beautiful Quad HD Quantum IPS panel. So this is a 1440 by um, 2560 display. It's basically designed to uh, beat last year's G3 display by adding this new quantum technology. I'm not quite sure what it does, but I can tell you this. It gets really bright and it looks really beautiful in terms of colors, contrast. Inside, you have a Snapdragon 808. Now, this is an interesting chip because, the, as you know, there's a Snapdragon 810. It's used on the M9 and the LG G Flex 2. And technically, the 808 is slightly below that in performance. It's a six-core processor, not an octa-core like the 810. But here's the advantage. It's a little more power efficient, and you get about 95% of the performance. There's also three gigs of RAM, 32 gigs of built-in in storage and as I said a micro SD card since the back cover is removable and the battery is also removable it's a 3000 milliamp hour battery but here is what I'm really excited about you're gonna say well so far so good but the camera oh the camera so specs 16 megapixel, f over 1.8 lens, so it's a super fast, and it has a three axis OIS, which is a brand new kind of OIS, even more effective than before. These two things here are interesting. This is the laser autofocus pod that's been on all LG phones since the G3, well, flagship ones anyway. G3 has it, G Flex 2 has it. They've improved the speed of the laser autofocus. Uh, it still uses some of the built-in uh, sensor-based autofocus as well, because if you're taking pictures through glass, this is obviously going to detect the glass. Um, this was a dual LED flash on the G3, and now it's a single LED, uh, single color, so it seems like a step down a bit, but if you look carefully here, underneath it is another sensor, and that's a color sensor. It's like basically a UV light sensor, and it basically can say, tell the phone that um, you know, what the general color of the scene is. And that's a really big deal because you can now get much more accurate white balance. So let me show you the camera app real quick. This is really tremendous and we'll use this guy as a model. This is, as you can see, the man full manual control interface. And the reason I love this is because you got everything you need. A histogram here, it tells you, you know, the white balance and how it's changing it in real time. What the light metering is, so if it's too dark, this little thing will move around, as you can see here, uh, to adjust. And then the ISO, your shutter speed, and the f-stop, which is always f of 1.8. And you can set everything manually. So if you go in here, you can set the ISO, you know, say I want to get uh, 200, so it's going to get a little darker. And now I can set my shutter speed, so you can fully manually adjust the shutter and ISO. You can also manually adjust the exposure if you want to do it that way instead of doing it um, in, with uh, shutter speed and ISO. And then finally you get manual focus and then the white balance, full manual controls is tremendous. Notice there's another little thing here is the raw JPEG setting, JPEG and JPEG plus raw. Now if you want, don't want to deal with this because you just want to give it to your grandma so she can just shoot a picture by tapping you know, the screen, there's a simple mode. And then there has um, an auto mode, which is a little more, con you know, it gives you the, the controls for video and all that and has some simple things you can tweak, like do I want HDR auto or HDR manual or whatever. This thing takes absolutely stunning pictures. Now, it's 
just a little better than the GS6 in some cases. Sometimes the GS6 is a little better than the G4, but ultimately you can't go wrong with either of these in terms of photography. Let's walk you through some of the details of this phone. As you can see, there's no buttons, they're on-screen buttons. What's cool is you can configure how many of these buttons and in which order you want them in in the UI. At the bottom, there's this kind of cool pattern all the way around the edge of the phone. And here you can clearly see on top, you've got a notification LED, um, front-facing camera, which I'm going to get back to in a second, the sensor for putting it to your face and brightness level, and of course the, the earpiece. That front-facing camera is no slouch. It's an 8 megapixel job. Uh, really good wide angle, uh, no autofocus or anything, but it takes really beautiful selfies. There's no buttons anywhere around, obviously, since LG puts their buttons on the back. So just going to show you the edges real quick. You've got the top here and the sides, as you can see, this, this fake metal chrome that's actually plastic, sadly. The only thing of interest is at the bottom, where you have the micro USB charge and data port right here. And then you've got the volume, sorry, the uh, headphone jack right there, standard headphone headset jack. Again, nothing on the left-hand side. Now here's that leather back. It's real leather with real stitching. And you know, it might not be to everyone's taste, but I think it's really quite beautiful. The usual button arrangement for all the recent LG phones, you get the power lock key here, the volume down, volume up. Things that I don't like too much, um, it's plastic and glass and maybe leather and glass if you get the leather version, but really a metal frame would be great. The other thing, I don't know if you can see here, but it's slightly curved. It's not G-Flex 2 curved and it's not flexible when you push on it, but it has a slight curve to the display. And I think LG is kind of going for that so that when you hold it to your face, it feels more natural and it feels nicer. There's a couple of things it doesn't have out of the box no fast or quick charging. It will take an hour and 45 minutes to fully charge the battery. As you know, the Galaxy S6, the HTC M9, and surprisingly, even the G Flex 2 before it uh, from LG all have this fast, quick charge. The prop with a proper charger, you can get about an 80% charge in like half an hour to 45 minutes. So that's a bit of a miss. I don't know why they've gone a step back on that. Uh, finally, there's also no wireless charging built in. There is support for it, but you need to get a back cover that supports a Qi or PMA for wireless charging. The pros are basically the camera, number one. This is absolutely tremendous camera. The display, incredibly gorgeous. Performance, the speed of this processor, even though it's an 808 and not an 810 and it seems like a, a step down, it is just so fast and beautiful, nothing lags, and I love that about this phone. Um, and then, you know, of course, some people think this is not really a big deal, and I personally can live without it, but having an interchangeable, interchangeable battery and micro SD support and different backs makes, you know, makes for, I think, a better phone in terms of a flagship device. Uh, the, the cons, as I said, you know, uh, they're very minor. No fast charge, no wireless charging out of the box. Um, I wish this phone was made out of metal, at least the main frame of it, rather than plastic, because, you know, it is a flagship device. So that's it, the LG G4 here on Before You Buy, a tremendous phone. I really cannot recommend this phone more. Go get it. Uh, you will be really, really happy. It's coming out sometime soon uh, and it's not the pricing hasn't really been announced and not nor, nor has the actual exact launch date for the u.s carriers but it's already available in korea and you know it's in the usual flagship price point so i expect this to be a hundred to two hundred dollars on contract and of course uh you know 650 or so uh, uh unsubsidized but again the pricing hasn't been finalized yet so again, this is Miriam uh, for Before You Buy with the LG G4, tremendous Android phone. Thanks to Miriam Jawar who gives a buy to the LG G4. We won't say that it's the best phone ever because that's a little bit of hyperbole, but it definitely can hold its own against the elite of the phone market. Now, now is the time where we do a parting shot. It's, it's a review of something that maybe doesn't deserve its own full 8, 10 minute review, but is actually still pretty interesting. Now, this is not what I'm reviewing. This is how I carry my smaller quadcopters around, my 250 classes. There's actually two in here. This is a repurposed bag that I found downstairs. And then, then Burke wanted it back, but I didn't give it to him. Uh, this holds everything I need for a day of flying. And the nice thing about this is it's semi-hard case 
so I can travel with it. But it is a little bit bulky, and I mean, if you look how I actually constructed it, this is cardboard that I've used, and it's, it's, it is a little bit of ghetto engineering. Not the most professional way to look when you're going to a drone fly. But there is something that might be a little bit better. This is the Low Pro Drone Guard. They specifically made this to carry around your quadcopter, your multi-rotor, when you want to go for a day of flying. In fact, Brian, you've got some B-roll that you can run here that'll show you some of the things that we've, I've used the Drone Guard for. Now, it is made out of ripstop nylon. It's actually really high quality. I'm surprised that it's, it feels like a camera bag. This is not a backpack. This is designed by a company that understands that bags are going to get tossed around. It uses this multi-compartment creation so that you can have a spot for your batteries, a spot for your transmitter, a spot for pretty much everything. You open it up at the top, and then this little buckle allows you to flap open the sides in order to carry more cargo and to access all the things that you might have uh, attached. And these removable storage pockets are actually held on by Velcro, so you can adjust the bag for the size of the multi-rotor craft that you might be using. That means that you can use it for something like a DJI Phantom or even a 250 if you adjust the pockets correctly. Now, all of this gear is what I would typically take on a day of flying. Everything from my batteries to my charger to my transmitter to spare props and of course some tools. Well, this, uh, this pouch here is perfect for putting in your batteries. It, it keeps them nice and safe. It's padded, which is kind of armored, so you're not going to have to worry about punctures. And it will even carry the charger and the cables separate from the batteries. Now, the nice thing is, because this separate pocket is also attached by Velcro, it means I can remove it when I want to just take my batteries out. If I want to leave my kit intact, but go ahead and, and start charging my batteries. Of course, it's going to carry all the tools, screwdrivers, pliers, and I love the fact that these wings will fold out to hold props, because you're going to be breaking a lot of props if you're flying. This is actually a nice way to hold them. Uh, props can get a little bit unwieldy at times. Now, it's, it's not just that they hold things in those, uh, those, those straps. It's also got padded pockets on the side that you can put everything that won't fit into a regular strap or pocket. That's screws. That's, that's the little bolts. Of course, that's, that's going to be propellers itself. Uh, all in all, I, I actually really like the design of this, especially since they understand the pieces you're going to need. This isn't a backpack that they've adapted for use by people who fly multi-rotors. It's designed specifically for people who fly multi-rotors. Of course, you're going to be able to put your craft right in the middle, which is nice because this is the unwieldy part of flying these things, especially something like the Phantom, which has the big landing gears. It, it doesn't fit really well into a backpack or, or even my custom bag here. It, it always looks strange. Now, you can adjust it, so you could use it on pretty much every class of craft. In fact, this is, this is a much larger, this is the Blackbird that we reviewed a few weeks back. It fits that. Now, the, the, the prop guards, not so great. It probably would work a lot better without them, but uh, it's, it's still pretty darn good. Now, pros, it's self-contained, it's padded, it's, it carries everything for days of flying. It uses modular construction that's adaptable to many different craft. The hard case means that it can be transported long distance because you can buy it in two versions, $99 for the soft case or $319 with the hard case. Now, it's still making its way to the market, but I'd say give it a couple of weeks and you're going to start to see these for street prices even below. On the cons, I would like to have had a few more strapping options. The Velcro is cool because it's, it's very quick to, to move around, but I, I'd like to be able to uh, strap things down when I really don't want them to move. And the thing that I would really have liked is if they made this a backpack instead of just a carry strap. If they had a couple straps over the top, they could have put a strap here on the back and it would have made this the ultimate in backpack capable multi-rotor craft. All in all, a very nice bag to have if you do fly, and uh, I'm going to have to give it a buy. That's the Low Pro Drone Guard. You'll probably find it on Amazon pretty, clean, uh, pretty soon. Uh, now, folks, normally that would be the end of the show, but we've got a little special something something. I received this literally about five minutes before I left for the studio today. A while back, I talked to my friends over at Kingston, and I said we were going to do some special projects. What do you have coming up? And my friends over there said, well, we've got some products that we're going to be releasing at some point in late April, maybe early May. We'd love to get, the, get it on before you buy, try it, and know how. So I have no idea what's in this box. They didn't actually tell me what they're sending, but I thought this now might be a good time to see what, uh, what some SSD experts might be sending us in the, their next generation. So uh, if I can avoid cutting myself to, to ribbons, let's open up the little care package. 
Now, uh, I, I've already promised not to share any of this with anyone from Twit. So, Brian, Karsten, you're not you're not getting any of this. This is uh, definitely going into my systems. We'll see about that. <laughs> see what we got here. The seal is is it's broken. Okay, I'm I'm breaking the seal. There we go. Ooh, oh, oh, oh. These are the okay. So these are the relaunched uh, uh, the 3K, the HyperX. These are the Savage ones. They do 560 uh, megabytes per second um, uh, read, and I believe it's 530 write. Ooh, and they say, oh, they sent me a couple. Oh, oh, oh. I know what this is. <laughs> okay, so um, one of the projects that I was talking to the Kingston people about is this idea of doing a performance raid. We're going to be getting a, uh, a Synology, a DS414 Slim, which is a pocket size RAID that uses two, uh, two and a half inch drives, or two and a quarter, yeah, two and a half inch drives. This is going to be my portable RAID. So this will weigh about a pound and give me all the performance I need to take a bunch of stuff really fast on the go. Now, uh, you know, I was kind of hoping that they would also have included the PCI SSD that we played with at CES, but this is a dang good start. So expect to see these soon. And before you buy, that's the Savage Solid State Drive. It's the upgrade to the 3K series from Kingston. Well, folks, that's all the time we have for this episode of Before You Buy. I want to thank all our reviewers, especially to Leo Laporte, to Megan Maroney, to Miriam Jouar, and, of course, to my super TD. Brian, you've been sitting back there watching all this drone stuff, watching mm -hmm. these SSD things. Uh, what, what are you doing these days? Uh, well, I'm doing know-how with you, and apparently we... You know, we've been doing a few drone things on that, and uh, but I'm looking forward to uh, those SSDs. Do you know what you're going to do with them after that project? Maybe like another gaming PC or something like that? Maybe? No. <laughs> no? no? You don't think so? Mm -mm. Mm. No, I think. Uh, but you know what? I've got some older SSDs I can give you. Oh, okay. Well, that's gonna I appreciate that. Do you see that? You know. do you see, do what I did there? <laughs> yeah. did that? <laughs> that, that's why I'm always excited when you get stuff in the mail, because I know there's something old that I'll get to play with. Yeah, oh, Brian, both of us are a know-how, which is, I'm, I'm now considering it a sister show before you buy it, because a lot of products make it back and forth. What are we doing next week? I have no idea, Padre. Jeez. I'd have to look at the rundown. Uh, we, we talked about it on the last episode, so people can check that out. But uh, when are you going to be on the new screensavers? Because that... There's an episode tomorrow. There's but... an episode. I, I'm actually on next week. So we're doing a okay. big Maker Fair special. I'll be on the new screensavers. Don't forget, folks, tomorrow, 3 o'clock p.m. Pacific, live.twit.tv for the new screensavers. Also, don't forget that you can find a lot of our products as picks just by going to twit.tv slash BYB or even going to the Twit TV homepage. We do the show live every Friday at 2-ish o'clock p.m. It depends on when Twite and Twill let out. But join us at live.twit.tv and you'll be able to see the pre-show, the post-show, and everything that goes on in between. And jump in the chat room so that I can see what you're doing. Just go to irc.twit.tv, ask questions during the show, and who knows, maybe we'll be able to answer them if you ask them at the right time. Finally, I want to thank everyone who makes this show possible. Of course, to Carson, the super producer, to Lisa and Leo for letting us do this show, and to my super TD, Brian. Uh, yeah, you again. Say, say hi. <laughs> say hi, Hippo. Uh, well, you know, you can find me on Twitter at cranky underscore hippo. That's where we post all our stuff behind the scenes. So if you want to see some cool pictures of uh, what the no-hole looks like or what we're working on for a new episode, check that out. Until next time, I'm Father Robert Ballas here reminding you you got to watch before you buy. These are mine. Give me those SSDs. No. <laughs>